All right, good morning, everybody. Um, since you are in a course that deals with locomotion and all the systems that are responsible, responsible for movement, namely the two big tissues or organs are, that are involved in locomotion. Huh? Bones and muscle, indeed. And of course, we need the brain, etc., etc. But today, we'll be talking about the biochemistry of bones and muscle, as you would expect. And we talked about both of these tissues, their composition and their basic metabolism already last year. So we today will be building on the knowledge from last year. So we're very briefly going to review it. Um, and then we'll first talk about the bone as a metabolic organ. And mostly we'll be talking about signaling both inside the bone and outside of the bone. So how various signals influence bone metabolism uh, bone growth, bone regeneration, rebuilding, um, which, as you'll see, is very important for clinical medicine, as there are many disorders of bone metabolism. Uh, and in the second half of the lecture, we'll be kind of expanding uh, what we talked about in the previous year um, about the metabolism of muscle, and namely skeletal muscle. So we'll be mostly talking about skeletal muscle. I'll mention maybe a few things about other kinds of muscle but those will be covered in later lectures, for example, in circulation, We're going to talk about the heart, etc. So, to start with, uh, let's talk very briefly about the composition of the bone. So what can we find in the bone? Hmm? In the bone. Yeah, I know it's early morning. <laughs> Okay, so let's structure it kind of logically, okay? So, so, tissue, so bone is a type of connective, yeah. uh, connective tissue, absolutely, that's true. And we can kind of divide bone into various components, broadly speaking. So hydroxyapatite is one of them, but that's quite low level, okay? So let's try to think about how to structure, if somebody asks you, what is bone, what is it made of? So you can say, okay, there's this part, there's this part, there's this part, and they have all constituents parts, because this is what we expect you to do in the exam, okay? To have a logical structure. So let's try to put it together, okay? So bone, what kind of components do we find in the bone? Hmm? Okay, so the extracellular matrix, absolutely. And the extracellular matrix also has some subcomponents. Indeed, yeah, so there's the organi organic part and the inorganic part. The inorganic part mostly is hydroxyapatite, so I agree with that. What is hydroxyapatite? What is it chemically? Anybody? Calcium. Yeah, it's calcium phosphate with some hydroxy stuff, okay? But yeah, okay, so that's the, the mineral part. And the organic part? Collagen yeah, so there are definitely collagen fibers, okay? Any specific type of collagen? Yeah, mostly it's collagen one, type one. And then there are loads and loads of different uh, proteins that are in the, in the extracellular matrix of the bone, which serve both partly structural reasons, so for structural reasons, but also metabolic reasons. So for example, some of them compounds like osteocalcin, which you probably heard about, osteocalcin maybe, okay, doesn't seem to ring a bell. But anyway, it's one of the proteins that we find in the extracellular matrix of the bone which helps the mineralization of the bone. So it helps to build the inorganic part, okay? Because the inorganic part needs to be built into crystals and there are these specific proteins that actually guide this mineralization process. I'll mention osteocalcin later on again. So we have the inorganic part, the organic part, okay? So there's the extracellular matrix. What else do we have in the bone? We have cells, okay? And what kind of cells do we have in bone? We have osteoclasts, osteoblasts, so those are the... And we have osteocytes, okay? Everybody forgets osteocytes, but they are actually the major population of cells in the bone, okay? Because osteoblasts and osteoclasts, where do we find those in the bone? Huh? The sides? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll get to osteocytes, but where, are, where can we find osteoblasts and osteoclasts? Versions, channels. 
No, not really. So there'll be osteocytes, but oh, in the channel itself. Well, there's a blood vessel there. There's a there's a blood vessel there. Okay. <laughs> But osteoblasts and osteoclasts are only on the surface of the bone, okay? Not only the outer surface, okay? So don't imagine that they're just on the outside of the bone, okay, under the periosteum. But wherever there's a surface, a trabeculae or whatever, then there we can find osteoblasts and osteoclasts. But inside of the bone, which is the majority of the tissue, there are no osteoclasts or osteoblasts. They're just osteocytes, yeah? Okay? Okay? Some of you are looking at me like... Uh, you don't agree, or I don't know, okay? So that's, that is how it is, okay? So the majority of cells are really osteocytes, and osteoblasts and osteoclasts are really there to remodel the bone, but what makes the tissue are osteocytes. And we'll be talking about osteocytes quite a bit today, because even though often they are thought that they are just kind of sitting, they were trapped in the exosome matrix, and they're just kind of, re they, they, ju they, were just, they remain after the building of the bone, and they just sit there, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Osteocytes are actually absolutely crucial, very active cells that do a lot of stuff in the bone. Okay, so try to focus your attention a little bit away from osteoblasts and osteoclasts to osteocytes, which are super important for a lot of signaling, as we'll see in a second. So, what I will draw is a very schematic drawing of the bone, so don't take from it that that's what the bone looks like, okay, because I can't fit the whole thing in, in, in one picture. But if we have any kind of surface of the bone, what we can find there in certain conditions, we can find little kind of cuboidal cells, which would be out of the three, where they're osteoblasts, okay? Osteoblasts. And these osteoblasts can be either active or relatively inactive, depending on whether the bone is being built up or whether there are some, some active, again, We'll see in a second how the, the regulation works. Then, in some places, we find a very different kind of a cell looking like this. It's the osteoclast, okay? And as you know, osteoclast, what, what, is, the, what is the origin of osteoclast? What kind of cells are they? Fusion of... Yeah, they're macrophages, okay? So they're a special type of macrophages. They're usually multinuclear. They have plenty of granuli inside because their job is obviously to dissolve, to remove the bone, okay? And that's why I drew them in this kind of lacuna because they are really digging into the bone, dissolving and digesting the bone, okay? So these two types of cells, osteoblasts and osteoclasts, are responsible for remodeling bone. So either building it up or breaking it down. And those two processes generally in our bones happen all the time at the same time, okay? So parts of the bone will be, all the time are being broken down and others are being built up, okay? So these things happen all the time, but as we said, this only happens on the surface of the bone, okay? Now inside of the bone, Okay, and I will use a cross-section like this so we won't see the haversian systems here. But inside the bone, of course, we have plenty of extracellular matrix, but then we have these osteocytes, okay? That, as I said, usually people forget about, but they are what forms the majority of the bone. And I specifically am drawing them as being interconnected because they are. So between osteocytes, as again, if you imagine the, the cross section of the bone, you have the little lacuna where, there's, where the, the osteocyte is, is sitting, and it gives an impression that it's really isolated from all the, all the other osteocytes. That is absolutely not true. There are little canals in the extracellular matrix through which the osteocytes are really sending projections and they are getting in touch with the other osteocytes and there are actually gap junctions between these projections. So all these osteocytes are really connected into a network which can communicate, which can exchange metabolites, which can exchange signals. Uh, and this is really what forms the bone. So even though there is this hard thing around them, 
the bones are sorry the the cells are connected in a similar way as you could imagine for example the the, the cardiac muscle okay in cardiac muscle we have cells that are in, interconnected they are exchanging signals they are doing things together they are coordinating etc okay so this is what the bone works like and looks like in reality okay so try to get this isolated osteocyte left behind during the formation of the bone uh, from your head okay that is not how bone actually works so we have the three types of cells, um, and these three types of cells, as we said, serve various functions, um, and they exchange lots of different signals. Uh, and these signals are what governs the health and the, the metabolism of the bone. Now, as you know, our bones are capable of remodeling themselves based on various stimuli. So, for example, the usual thing both in development but also later on, is that um, the, the cells of the bone, mainly osteocytes, are capable of sensing pressure, okay? So they can, they have mechanal sensation. And they know where there is more pressure on the bone, they know where there is less pressure of the bone, they sometimes can tell if the bone is moving in a, in a way or whether it's being rotated. And based on this mechanosensation, they can then, then tell all the other cells, again, I'll give you the signals in a second, they can tell the other cells either this part of the bone is not really needed, there's no pressure there, get away with it, okay? Dissolve it, okay? Here there's a part of the bone which is being really heavily used, okay? There's a lot of pressure on it, let's build it stronger here. Okay, and this is what the bones are doing at the same time. So that's why when you have a fracture, for example, and then you know the fracture is put together, maybe well or maybe not so well, but the bone actually over time remodels itself and, and gets close to the original, to the best possible configuration based on uh, the, the pressures that are being acted on it. Okay, so this mechanosensation or mechanosensory function of osteocytes is absolutely crucial for that. Well, sort of. I mean, it's the bone. Huh? Can you train bone? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you have physical activity, then the bones are getting stronger. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you don't have any physical activity, then the, the, the bones are atrophying and they can, you know, get osteoporosis, etc. And this is something that's, that's why we have this lecture, because bone health is actually one of the most important determinants of the quality of life in elderly people. Okay? When they have osteoporosis, when they have fractures, that usually means, or often it can mean, then they can't get off the bed because, because they are f too frail to really do anything, or they have fractures, and it usually leads to an early death. Okay? So bones are, even though we often forget about them or we think about them, okay, that there, there was a fracture because, I don't know, I fell from somewhere. Um, but especially in, in advanced age, bone health is absolutely critical to the quality of life. So, we have mechanosensation. Now, how do, yeah? Is there any research on which exercises are actually the best for building? There's plenty of research, okay? I can't go into details, but you can easily find it, okay? There's a lot of research on that because, as I said, it's together with muscle atrophy, bone atrophy is one of the biggest topics in geriatric medicine, okay? So, it's super, super important, and yeah, there's plenty of research on that. Uh, generally, it means applying pressure on the bones. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> so as the osteocytes sense what is happening, what the pressures are, how the bone is moving, how it's bending, okay, they start sending signals to the neighboring osteocytes, obviously, but also to the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. So what kind of, what kind of signals do we get from, uh, from osteocytes? So one important signal, and we'll see it a few times now, is called rankle. I will use a different color. So this is an acronym, rankle. It actually stands for another acronym, rank ligand. So it is a ligand for rank receptors, okay? And this rankle signal, one of the primary meanings of the signal is to activate osteoclasts to start degrading the bone, okay? So for example, when there's not enough pressure on the bone, the osteocytes are saying, okay, we don't need that much bone here, okay? 
let's break it down. So they start releasing Rankle, which activates osteoclasts and activates their you know, degradation enzymes and everything so, so that they can break down the bone. Now, as it often happens in human body, things are way more complicated than just having one signal doing everything or you know, not having any feedback loops or anything like that. So at the same time with Rankle, not at the same time, but uh, in addition to Rankel, uh, that's the same color. Uh, I don't know what's easy to see and what isn't easy to see. Uh, uh, in addition to Rankel, they also, the osteocytes, are also cap capable of secreting an antagonist of Rankel. Okay? So a molecule that actually binds. Can you see the blue? Not very much. Okay. Uh, I'll use this one, then this works. So they can also secrete another molecule called osteoprotegerin, I'll write it down, or OPG. Osteoprotegerin, and you can see that it's something that protects the bone. Osteoprotegerin protects the bone, yeah, okay. An OPG is an antagonist of Runkle. In fact, oste osteoprotegerin actually binds to Runkle and disables the binding of Runkle to rank receptors. Okay, so these are rank receptors on osteoclasts. And osteoprotegerin basically just binds to this and, and disables the binding of Runkle. Okay? So that means we, we have two molecules which oppose that, or rather, we have one molecule that starts degrading the bone or activates osteoclast, the other one that prevents that. And you can see or you can imagine that as we have this network of osteocytes, some of those that will be sensing very little pressure will be secreting a lot of rankle, but maybe a little bit further away when there's a little bit of pressure, they might, be actually, they might start secreting osteoprotegerin to kind of limit the area of where the bone is going to be degraded, okay? So you would get different signals from different osteocytes and really th that will help the bone to localize the place where the bone should be degraded and where it should not be degraded anymore, okay? So these two things work against each other. The, the Yeah, you could, no, 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 sorry. If, if, if the bone is not, if there's no load on the bone, the osteocytes are likely to secrete rankle because you can start degrading the bone because it's not being used, okay? On the other hand, when it is being used, then osteoprotegerin will block the, uh, the degradation of the part, okay? I'm simplifying, okay? Of course, there are many, many, many other signals that I'm leaving out, okay? I will tell you another one. Um, the reason why I'm telling you these names of these proteins, first of all, because I think it's interesting, uh, but second, we'll see towards the end of this part about the bone that there are actually medications that interfere with this signaling, with these, with these signaling pathways, okay? So hence the, the re that's the reason. So we have Rankle and its antagonist osteoprotegerin. The third and probably final at this point signal that comes from, at this point, mainly from osteocytes is called sclerostin. Sclerostin. What we'll yeah. Let's abbreviate it as CL. I don't know what the official abbreviation is. Huh? Oh, there you go. That's much nicer. Sclerostin. What sclerostin does it blocks the activity of osteoblasts, okay? So it prevents osteoblasts from making new bone, okay? So it is an antagonist, or well, no, not an antagonist, but it blocks the activi activity of osteoblasts, okay? So now we have three different signals that the osteocytes can offer to, to the bone or can secrete into the bone. Again, I'm leaving out many other signals. They're also important, but let's use these three. We have one that activates osteoclasts, we have one that blocks the activation of, osteo, osteobla, uh, of osteoclasts, and we have one that activates osteoblasts. Oh, sorry, that inactivates osteoblasts. And this kind of uh, 
interplay between these signals is really able to govern, uh, to regulate the, the remodeling of the bone depending on mainly on mechanosensation. sensation. Now in a second, I will add some external signals that also influence this whole network, okay? But we started with just local situation, okay? It's mechanosensation, sensation and these signals go out. All right. Um, so let's now have a look at what can come from the outside. And you already know that there are a few hormones which influence the metabolism of the bone and the growth of the bone, etc. So what, what external signals, namely hormones, again, I'm leaving prostaglandins out and there are lots of local things, um, but let's talk about hormones that influence bone. What would those be? Huh? There's definitely estrogen, but let's leave estrogen uh, towards the end. Can you see this one? Yeah, that works, right? Yeah, okay. So now we have the, the external one. So estrogen, yeah, I agree. We'll, we'll get briefly to estrogen. There's parathormone. There's calcitonin. and calcitriol. Okay, so those would be the main external signals that influence the, the functioning of the bone, as in the growth and degradation of the bone. Let's talk about what these hormones do. So let's start with parathormone. Parathormone from the parathyroid, you, you probably know that and you will hear more about the production of parathormone later on. What does parathormone do? What is, what, is the, what is the meaning of parathormone? What is the signal that it's sending to the body? So what, what, I mean, in which situation will parathormone be secreted? Let's start from this point. Yeah, so low calcium levels in the blood, okay? Which means that parathormone is released and the idea is that obviously it should increase the amount of calcium in the blood. Okay, again, in the parathyroid, the cells are sensing the amount of calcium in the blood. There is a receptor for calcium, okay? So they sense it, and if there is not enough calcium, they start secreting parathormone. Now, parathormone acts on several different tissues, apart from the bone. What are the tissues, if you've already heard about that? Yeah, it acts in the kidneys, and to some extent in the intestine, okay? To increase reabsorption and absorption of calcium. But we're now interested in the bone. So what does parathormone do in the bone? Well, in the bone, the main effect of parathormone is to activate osteoclasts, okay? It kind of makes sense. There's not enough calcium in the blood. We have plenty of calcium in the extracellular matrix of the bone, so we want to release it into the blood in order to get the, the calcium level in the blood to where it should be, okay? Now, interestingly, Osteoclasts do not have a receptor for parathormone. Okay, so they can't respond to parathormone. What happens instead is that parathormone binds to parathormone receptors on the osteoblasts. Okay, so there's a PTH receptor here on osteoblasts. And in response to the binding of parathormone to these receptors, osteoblasts secrete rankle. Rankle, this thing that we saw before that activates osteoclasts. So, it is, it is, absolutely. Okay, but here we talked about rankle being secreted in response to, to mechanical factors, to mechanosensation, okay? That there is actually, so osteocytes do themselves have PTH receptors. So parathormone can also activate the secretion of rankle from osteocytes. How important that is, we don't know, okay? But, but they can do it as well, okay? But usually the main pathway is because they're kind of close to each other, okay, with osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So the, the, the usual pathway is that the, the parathormone activates rankle secretion from osteoblasts, okay? So there's an indirect effect, or indirect signaling of parathormone on osteoclasts, okay? So this is the way through which parathormone increases uh, calcium in the blood from the bone. Yeah. 
the osteoblasts. Um, there may be some sh shear, um, so basically there's a fluid around and they can probably detect the, the flow of the fluid, but they're not really important mechanosensory mechanos cells, no. Okay. So, but now we're talking about signals coming from the outside. Okay. So we, we talked about what happens inside the bone when it kind of self-regulates, but this is regulation from the outside. Now, um, the interesting thing is that parathormone has two different effects on the bone, depending on whether it is being secreted all the time, so a constitutive secretion, or whether it is secreted in pulses, usually once a day. So there's a big increase, okay, and then it goes down. And these two types of secretion of parathormone give completely different results, give completely different effects on the bone. So the one that I just mentioned, where we get a secretion of rankle and therefore activation of osteoclasts, is the one caused by constitutive increase, so continuously increased concentration of parathormone. So this is what happens when we have hypocalcemia, we need to get calcium from the bones, okay? So parathormone will be secreted most of the time, and it will cause a degradation of the bone through this mechanism. However, if parathormone is secreted in pulses, we get the opposite effect. So if parathormone, so this would be continuous, this would be intermittent. So if we have intermittent effect of parathormone, then what happens is that osteoblasts are actually activated, they're activate, they're, the activity increases, they start building the bone, and moreover, they secrete osteoprotegerin. So remember, that's the molecule that blocks the effect of Rankle. Okay, so usually people say, and, and, and it's correct, and you'll find in textbooks, parathormone causes bone degradation. Yes, it does, but only when the concentration of parathormone in the secretion is continuous. If it is discontinuous, if it's pulsatile, it actually helps build up the bone. It is what we call osteoanabolic hormone. Well, it doesn't. That's what I'm saying. Okay, and that's actually a very common thing. Okay, that hormones can have different effects depending on how they are secreted, how often they are secreted, what concentration they have, what the context is. Okay, so the version that we usually give you here, okay, is a simplified version, but here this is the almost full version of what goes on. Okay, so parathormone, depending on how it is secreted, will have two completely opposite effects on the bone. Okay, and the reason why I'm telling you that, first of all it's good to know that things are more complicated than we usually tell you, okay? But second of all, this is actually clinically used, okay? I'll get to that in a second, okay? So parathormone, two different effects, depending on how it is secreted. First, it can be osteocatabolic, degrading the, the bone if it is continuous, or it can be osteoanabolic, it can build up the bone if it is pulsatile. So that's parathormone, okay, very briefly, and I will, I will mention once more when, when I talk about some of the pharmacological agents um, that are related to that. Next one, next hormone is calcitonin. Okay, calcitonin from the thyroid gland, C cells, okay, again, will be covered more later on in endocrinology. What is the situation when calcitonin is released? Yeah, so it is released in hypercalcemia, okay, in hypercalcemia. Uh, and the textbook, the textbook reason, or the textbook signal, uh, or the textbook version of what calcitonin does is, what you find everywhere, is that it decreases the amount of calcium in the blood. Well, that is probably not quite true, okay? In fact, the full function of calcitonin is still unknown. Okay, so it is not quite certain yet what calcitonin does. There have been experiments a few years ago when they prepared, when they made uh, transgenic mice that had no calcitonin and the mice were normal, okay, they were fine. 
that no, no hypercalcemia or anything like that. Okay, so we're just functioning fine. Okay, I could go in, into details, but I will tell you what, what calcitonin does in the bone, and that is probably the main effect of calcitonin. Okay, um, you may hear later on when we talk about kidneys, somewhere in textbooks, etc., you may find that calcitonin also works in the kidneys. It probably doesn't, okay? So latest research is saying that probably not. The main place where calcitonin acts is in the bone, and it acts by inhibiting the activity of osteoclasts. So. So it appears the main effect of calcitonin is to block the activity of osteoclasts. Now, if you think about it, again, the, the textbook version is calcitonin decreases the amount of calcium in the blood. Well, if the only place, it's not quite true, okay, but if the main place where calcitonin acts are osteoclasts, it's not going to decrease calcium concentration in the blood. How would it, right? It just maybe stops the increase Okay, by acting by by breaking the the activity of um, of osteoclasts, but it's not going to decrease the concentration of calcium. Okay, and it doesn't. Okay, so what calcitonin does is, if there is too much breakdown of the bone, it will block it. And it appears from latest research that the main role of calcitonin is to stop the breakdown of bone when parathormone secretion overdoes it. So basically, if, if there is hypocalcemia, parathormone is secreted because the body knows that there's not enough calcium. And as parathormone is secreted at high levels, a lot of breakdown of the bone will start. And sometimes it can be too much, and that's when calcitonin comes in and stops it. So calcitonin probably has this very special role, okay? It's not about decreasing the amount of calcium in the blood, but it is kind of putting a break on too much parathormone action, okay? So it is kind of an antagonist to parathormone in that it, that it limits the, the amount of breakdown of the bone, okay? As I said, the details are still being researched. It's interesting that it's one of the very old uh, hormones known for a long time, but the, the, the details of, of its function are still uh, yeah, still, still being researched. Right, so that's calcitonin. Um, and finally, we'll get to estrogen as well, but finally calcitriol, which is, as you know, vitamin D derivative. Um, the signaling of, uh, of calcitriol is complex, okay? As you know, it has uh, nuclear receptors, so it goes into the nucleus where it, it changes the transcription of various uh, genes. It acts in the kidneys, it acts in the intestines, but also acts in the bone. Now, the effect of vitamin D, of calcitriol, on the bone is once again a little complicated, okay? Uh, for a long time, it was thought that if you give patients with osteoporosis, if you give them a lot of vitamin D, the bone, their bone um, mass will increase. But that's not what happens, okay? So vitamin D also has this kind of two-phase uh, activity, okay? So if you give vitamin D or calcitriol to, to patients or to people who have a sufficient amount of calcium in their diet, then calcitriol will increase the, the amount of, of bone. So it will basically help the, the calcium to get into the bone and to be built into the extracellular matrix. If you give calcitriol to people who have not enough calcium in their diet, okay, so the diet is, is deficient in calcium, the opposite will happen. Calcitriol will actually start, will increase the breakdown of the bone, okay, and they will actually lose bone mass. I will not go into details what it does with these signals, okay, it's quite complicated and it's very context specific, so there are a lot of kind of feedback loops that make it quite difficult to describe the function of calcitriol, okay. At the moment, I think it's enough to know that it can build, build up bone or it can degrade bone depending on how much calcium there is in the diet, okay? So this is again something for clinical medicine which is quite important for people in, with osteoporosis that if you give calcitriol, you have to give calcium as well, usually, unless they obviously have enough in the diet which especially for elderly people is not common, so often they have calcium deficiency. 
Yeah, and then we have estrogen and testosterone or other, or other estrogens and androgens. Um, the, the sex hormones generally are osteoanabolic, so they protect the bone, okay? Either they help, it, they help build it up or they protect it, depending on whether it's during development or whether it's in later years, okay? Once again, the exact signaling of the sex hormones is relatively complicated, so I'm not gonna go into details. But at this point, if you just know that estrogen and androgens both protect the bone and, and keep the mass, okay? And as they decline, especially in later years, and especially in women, because estrogens are much stronger protective signals, um, as they decline, there's a much bigger risk of osteoporosis. Now, in the last few minutes that we have in this part, uh, in the bone part, uh, let me give you two things. First, I will just mention, it's not necessary to remember those things, but I will mention a few very new pharmacological agents that interfere with the signaling and is, is actually registered. It's used in clinical medicine. They are used in clinical medicine at the moment. So I'll just tell you about them. Um, and then I will tell you about some markers of bone metabolism that we can measure in the blood. Okay, so this is gonna be more of a list than, than explanation. So, um, one medication uh, which has already been around for a few years now, so it's not super new, is an antibody against rankle. Sorry, I put it into rank, but it should be against rankle. So let's put it here. So it's an antibody, it's monoclonal antibody called denosumab. Maybe you've already seen a few medications that are monoclonal antibodies, and they usually end with MAP, which stands for monoclonal antibody. So if you see something like UMAP, IMAP, usually it's a monoclonal antibody, okay? So denosumab is a monoclonal, monoclonal antibody against rankle, and the idea is quite clear. It blocks the signaling through rankle, and therefore it blocks the de degradation of the bone. And it is mainly used in osteoporosis, okay? It's very expensive, it's relatively effective, okay, but you'll see that there are more and more of these new medications that interfere with the signaling, okay? So the old medications for osteoporosis basically were just chemicals that blocked the activity of osteoclasts. The only thing that we could have done previously until, yeah, whatever, a few years ago, um, was to kind of stop the degradation of, of the bone and keep the bone mass as long as possible, okay? But now, and that's what the old medications called bisphosphonates are doing. And denosumab as an antibody is doing pretty much the same thing. It just blocks the signaling through rankle, so it deactivates osteoclasts and it tries to keep the bone mass as long as possible. But there was, and there has been, there still is, a lot of search for osteoanabolic hormones. So basically, sorry, not hormones, but medications that could build up the bone. So even though you've already lost some, you could build up new, which obviously would be great if that could work. One of the ones that, again, has been around for a few years is actually a parathormone analog. So remember, we said that parathormone has two different effects. If it is constitutively secreted, it degrades the bone. If you give it in pulses, it actually builds up the bone. So there is a peptide, which is kind of just chopped up parathormone, it's part of a parathormone called teriparatide. Teri, teriparatide, which is a part of the parathormone, parathormone molecule, which is given in injections once a day. So it's a pulsatile you know, secretion or mimicking par, uh, pulsatile secretion. And it has been shown to really start building up the bone. So increase bone mass even in people with osteoporosis. Um, there are issues with teriparatide. Side effects, risks, okay? So now there are, there are many, many, many other kind of either synthetic or slightly modified parathormone analogs which really use this fact that if you give parathormone in pulses, it starts building up the bone. The last medication is very new. It was registered in 2019, so well, relatively new. Um, is an antibody against sclerostin. 
Remember, sclerostin was this thing that blocked the activity of osteoblasts, okay? It blocked the, the growth of the bone. So the idea is we block the signaling through sclerostin and we increase the growth of the bone. Um, the antibody is called romosumab. Once again, you see this umab or mab. It's an antibody, it's a monoclonal antibody that blocks the activity of sclerostin and also has been shown to increase bone mass even in people with osteoporosis. So, as you can see, understanding the signaling in the bone is absolutely crucial to be able to treat patients with osteoporosis, which is a massive problem and a massive cause of uh, other health problems, early death, uh, decrease in the quality of life. Okay? So understanding what goes on in the, in the bone, and again, I'm leaving out a lot of details, so those of you who might be interested in researching this or doing this clinically, you will know that you, know, you will learn many, many more details, but this is kind of the overview. As I said, there are some markers of bone health and both bone metabolism. And so these markers could be measured in the blood and we can find out whether the bone is being degraded or whether it's being built up. Um, the classical marker of bone formation, formation is alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme which is present in osteoblasts. And as the activity of osteoblasts goes up, the amount of ALP in the blood goes up as well. Alkaline phosphatase. Sorry? Is that like a degrading? No, uh, no. Uh, the function of this enzyme is unknown, okay? We don't know what it actually does in the osteocyte, which is amazing. It's been measured for like 60 years or something in clinical, uh, in clinical biochemistry. It's not clear what it actually does, but there's plenty of it in osteoblasts, and as they increase their activity, it leaks into the blood and we can measure it as a marker, okay? There are different isoenzymes of alkaline phosphatase. The major one that we find in the blood actually comes from the liver. So it is a liver enzyme as well, but we can distinguish between the liver isoenzyme and the bone isoenzyme. So here we are measuring the bone specific ALP, okay? But once you talk about liver, you will learn about the other, the liver specific ALP as an important liver marker, okay? So we need to distinguish between the two, otherwise it will be a mess. Um, <coughs> the other marker of, of bone formation is osteocalcin. Osteocalcin. I mentioned it, it's part of the extracellular matrix. It helps the mineralization. It actually binds calcium and allows the hydroxyapatite crystals to form. Interestingly, and this is something that I think is quite useful to know, um, it might give you bonus points anyway. Osteocalcin requires vitamin K for its synthesis. So it's similar to, for example, coagulation factors that require vitamin K. And osteocalcin requires it for the same reason as the coagulation factors. You may remember, who remembers what, why we need vitamin K for coagulation factors? Something related to glutamate? Yes, there's this glutamate carboxylation. So we add, we, we add another carboxy group to glutamate. We have two carboxy groups which bind calcium. That's, that's why we have that. And that's what vitamin K is needed for. Osteocalcin has this carboxy glutamate as well. Okay, so that's just a side thing. We, yeah, we, we like when students remember that osteocalcin also requires vitamin K. Um, but anyway, but you know, it's a bonus thing, really. The last, the last marker of bone formation that I mentioned is our pro-collagen propeptides. which are basically just the remains as collagen is being synthesized. And I will not go into details about collagen synthesis because you've done it previously. But as collagen is being synthesized, bits of it, these propeptides, are being chopped off. Okay? So pro-collagen pro propeptides are just a measure of how much collagen is being made. Okay? So it's a proxy for how much bone is being made because that's where the majority of collagen is being synthesized. Okay? We also have markers of bone degradation.
and here to make things um, yeah, uh, a little complicated, we can measure the acidic phosphatase, which is the enzyme of osteoclasts. But nowadays, the main marker, which is recommended as the marker of uh, bone degradation, are collagen telopeptides. What are these? Well, as the bone is being degraded, the fully formed collagen is being chopped up. And this is what collagen telopeptides are. They are part of the collagen molecule, which is only released when collagen is being degraded. Okay? So it is really a marker of collagen degradation. Yeah, I, I, will, I will give you the acidic phosphatase as well, uh, but I don't think it is recommended at the moment. This is the abbreviation. So acidic phosphatase, acidic phosphatase, we had alkaline phosphatase, this is acidic phosphatase, and the TR stands for tartrate resistant. Don't worry about it, what that means. Okay, it's for some historical reasons. It's tartrate resistance, resistant acidic phosphatase. And when I said that for alkaline phosphatase, we don't know what the enzyme actually does, for acidic phosphatase, we know exactly what it does. It's the thing that dissolves the bone. So it's being secreted from the osteoclast into the extracellular space, and it really dissolves the bone. So that's another marker of bone degradation, but the best one are the collagen telopeptides. All right, any questions about the bone? Lots of new information, probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, to treat osteoporosis, why not use calcitonin and calcitriol with the vitamin D rich diet? Yeah, so calcitonin has been, has been used for treating osteoporosis. It doesn't really work very well. So, nowadays, calcitonin is really only used, and this will complicate things further, I think, is pretty much only used for cancer metastases in the bone. Okay? because it decreases the pain. I'll leave it at that, okay? It's complicated, but anyway, it doesn't work for osteoporosis. If, if you give patients with osteoporosis, osteocalcin, uh, uh, calcitonin, sorry, it's not gonna help them, okay? Uh, yes, you could probably have some complicated combination treatment, but it's very difficult to do clinical trials on these complicated combination treatments, so we don't have the data. It is possible that if you combine several things, it might work, okay? But usually it's much easier to do clinical trials on one thing, and that's why these pharma companies are developing these, these new monoclonal antibodies and stuff like that. That's it calcitonin. might work. Sorry? That's calcitonin. Yeah, so calcitonin does not work in osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Okay? But some of these other teriparatide, et cetera, they work. But normally it should slow down at least bone degradation. It will. Well, it, it will. Not, not massively. Uh, and also quite expensive. There are other medications like bisphosphonates which are much cheaper and do the same thing. Okay, so why use calcitonin? Because it's expensive and you have to give it intranasally, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Lots of details why calcitonin is not really useful for osteoporosis. No, it, if, it, uh, if they have enough calcium in the diet, okay? So if they have not enough calcium, actually it will start degrading the bone, okay? Again, it's a simplification. There are probably lots of other inter-individual differences and estrogen, et cetera, will play into that. But as a rule of thumb, that's how it works. All right, let's take a very short break, three minutes, and we'll continue with the muscle. All right, let's uh, continue with uh, a similar treatment of the muscle. Now, as I said, we'll be talking primarily about skeletal muscle. Uh, which is a very large organ, okay? Lots of it in the body. Um, and when in the bone we talked about mainly signaling between various cell types in the, in the tissue, here I want to talk mainly about skeletal muscle as a metabolic organ, okay? So it's gonna be not so much signaling, there's gonna be some signaling, um, but mainly what I want to talk about is how muscle uses various energy substrates in order to carry out the contraction, okay? Why do we talk about that? Well, first of all, again, I think it's interesting and it's good to know. But since we have so much skeletal muscle, any kind of substrate used by skeletal muscle will influence the whole body. Okay? So it's such a big organ 
that if it starts using preferentially one substrate or the other, it will influence the rest of the body quite significantly. Um, so that's why we're going to talk about in more details about how that happens. Now, I will not go through the, uh, the cascade of contraction. I will assume that that's what you know or you can easily review that. Okay, but it's something that even in this year we will expect you to know. Okay, so it's not something that you can just leave behind. But understanding the, the stimulus contraction coupling and all these processes is, I will assume that you know that. Okay. Now, how is it with the substrates? So we will go through some like time series of what happens when the contraction starts and what, what goes on. Uh, but let's have a look at it first from the perspective of, let's say, the whole person or the whole body, okay? So what is the main, in your view, what is the main substrate that the muscles are using most of the time, skeletal muscle, are using most of the time? So as you sit here, as you, you know, walk around the, the corridors, what, what, are the, the main, what is the main substrate, energy substrate that muscle uses for ATP production? Hmm? It is fatty acids, absolutely. And we briefly mentioned last year, okay? But yes, it is absolutely fatty acids. So uh, during kind of low level exercise, so at rest and low level exercise, the majority of ATP which is produced in our muscles is produced through beta oxidation of fatty acids. So if we take a muscle fiber, so we have some mitochondria, we have some sarcomeres and myofibrils and whatever, there's a T tubule, okay, there's a sarcoplasmic reticulum somewhere around here and triads and all these things, you remember that? So most of the time muscle is using fatty acids. Now where do the fatty acids come from? There are two sources of fatty acids for the muscle. One possibility is that they come from the blood. There are some free fatty acids in the, in the blood, usually depending on whether we're fasting or whether we have, we're in a fat state. In a fat state, the level of free fatty acids is very low. In a fasted state, it's much higher. But of course, we can get free fatty acids even when they are not free in the blood. Maybe I'm overcomplicating things, but. Um, so what happens in a, in a fat state? What, what form are lipids in the blood in a fat state? Yes, yes, as as a part of. No, in the blood. We're talking about the blood. It's lipoproteins. Okay, so in the fat state, they're all in lipoproteins as triglycerols or some other forms of that. Okay, in a fasted state, they are mainly as free fatty acids. Okay, big difference. Again, something that we'll cover later on. How do we get fatty acids from a lipoprotein? They are there as triglycerols, correct? How do we get them out? Lipoprotein Correct. Okay, this is lipoprotein lipase, lipase, which is an enzyme on the endothelium which pulls the fatty acid. So we have fatty acids coming into the muscle, either from free fatty acids in the blood or through the action of lipoprotein lipase. And again, traditionally, and in some older textbooks, you will find that fatty acids just cross the membrane. They don't need any transporter. Okay. Now we know they do need a transporter. So, I mean, they can cross the membrane, but it's not very efficient, it's not very fast. So there's a transporter for fatty acids called FAT, fatty acid translocator. Uh, there are also different names for it, but I mean, this is probably the easy, easiest one. Um, and they are transported into the muscle and then obviously can be metabolized in beta oxidation in mitochondria, okay? We need some transport, we need some shuttle, some transport, some, something to pull them into mitochondria. What is it? For fatty acids to get into mitochondria, we need, yeah, we need carnitine to be formed into acylcarnitine. Just, yeah, okay, carnitine is needed for that. So that's one source of fatty acids for the muscle. The other source, which is a much more at hand, are actually lipid triglycerol uh, droplets that are inside the muscle. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the second source. Okay, so either they can be taking fatty acids from the blood, okay, either as free or from, from lipoproteins, or there are lipid droplets, well, they're probably a little bit bigger than this, lipid droplets inside 
the, uh, the muscle fiber. Okay? So even though there may be some adipose tissue, some adipose tissue around the muscle itself, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about lipid droplets directly inside the muscle. Now, for a long time, it was thought, when they were discovered, these lipid droplets, it was thought that they are a pathological thing, that they're only present in patients with diabetes, with obesity, and they are a bad thing. But then they did research in like marathon runners and actually found out that they have even more in intramyocellular lipids. Sorry, this stands for intramyocellular lipids. Intramyocellular lipids, okay, droplets of fat um, inside the, the muscle fiber. So it was found that highly trained athletes have a lot, actually even more intramyocellular lipids than do these patients with obesity and diabetes. And since then we know that, that these lipids, these lipid droplets are actually crucial for the good functioning of the, uh, of the muscle. So these can be hydrolyzed. So these are triacylglycerols, okay? And they can be hydrolyzed to fatty acids by means of a lipase that you've heard of. It is hormone-sensitive lipase, yes indeed. So the same lipase that we get in adipose tissue is here and can hydrolyze these triacylglycerols for the use in mitochondria and beta oxidation. Okay, there is another, for those of you who are super interested in this, there's another lipase called adipose tissue, uh, adipose tissue triacylglycerol lipase, uh, which is another lipase. But anyway, it's enough to know the hormone sensitive lipase, okay? So, two sources of fatty acids, one is from the outside, one is from the inside. There is a complex interplay of these processes because some of the fatty acids actually come into the cell and first they are esterified into triacylglycerols and then they are hydrolyzed again to be used in the, in the beta oxidation. So it's a relatively complex dynamic system of moving fatty acids from, trus, from the intramyocellular lipids into the mitochondria, etc. Okay, but in a simplified way, there are two possible sources of fatty acids for the muscle. Okay. Interestingly, obese people and untrained people will have many more lipid droplets that are closer to the membrane, while trained people, athletes, marathon runners, etc., will have more lipids which are closer to the sarcomere. Okay, so it looks like in untrained people or obese people, etc., they're just kind of this, they're stores of fat that are not really very useful. Okay, in trained people, they're much closer to where they are needed. Um, and apparently they are serving the purpose quite, quite well. So that's fatty acids. Now, our skeletal muscles generally are using, the, for their production of ATP, they're using primarily fatty acids, but as the load, as the intensity of exercise increases, the proportion of ATP or of energy which is being, which is being sourced from fatty acids decreases. So, well, first it increases and then it decreases. There is what's called a crossover point. So basically what we get is, if we look at fatty acids, it increases, 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 and then it starts decreasing quite sharply. So this would be energy from fatty acids. And if we look at carbohydrates, it starts from near zero, and then it goes quite sharply up. There is a point where the exchange which is called the crossover point or substrate crossover point. Substrate crossover point, which is approximately at 65% of a maximal load. Okay, we can measure it in different ways, but let's, let's put it that way. So around 65% of maximum our muscles start using more carbohydrates. Huh? Of what you can do. So each person has a maximum before they fail, okay? And as you, as you get to 65% of your maximum, your muscles will start using more carbohydrates. Okay? So you can measure it two different ways, okay? It could be, for example, in resistive training, it could be the maximum load, the maximum mass that you can lift, okay? Often it is measured as maximum oxygen consumption, so VO max, 
I didn't want to go into so much details, but the O2 max, 65% of the O2 max. Okay. Uh, now, at about 80%, sorry, I'm not really drawing it to scale, I see, but at approximately 80% max, the carbohydrates basically take over. Okay, so it's almost 100% carbohydrates. It's not exactly 100%, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the proportion of carbohydrates goes up quite significantly. All right, so we have fatty acids. Now, now let's have a look at carbohydrates, okay? Carbohydrates. The y-axis, yes. Percent energy or whatever. Well, there are there are fatty acids being used even at like at rest. Okay, yeah. I mean, you could probably say that it's it's not. Sorry, I, I didn't draw it exactly right. But yeah, it should obviously sum to to one hundred. Yes. Okay. Right. So for carbohydrates, yes. Um, okay, uh, so yes and no, okay? So the, the thing that determines whether it's aerobic or anaerobic is really the intensity, okay? So as you increase the intensity, it becomes more car carbohydrate dependent, and obviously at the very highest inten intensities, the majority of the metabolism will be anaerobic. We'll, we'll get to that in a second, okay? What happens with these carbohydrates? There is an, an additional parameter which changes or which can influence this ratio of carbohydrates to fatty acids, and that is time. So in very short bouts of very intensive exercise, it's gonna be almost all carbohydrates because they're relatively quick to be, uh, to be metabolized. But as the, as the exercise continues, more and more fat, so, so this, is, this has nothing to do with time, this is just intensity, but if we looked at time, we could see that over time, more and more fatty, fatty acids will be, will be metabolized because the, the muscles adapt to the longer exercise and they start using more and more fatty acids because they are more efficient, okay? Um, but I don't want to overcomplicate things, okay? But this, this is what happens. But still, if, if we are at around 80% max, it's going to be all carbohydrates. And still, and, and basically, you will not be able to sustain it very long, okay? So you can't really do an, an hour-long exercise at 80% maximum. So it's just going to be carbohydrates all the time. All right. What are the sources of carbohydrates for the muscle? Similar to fatty acids, we have two main sources. One is coming from the outside, blood glucose, sorry? Well, yeah, but we are already in the muscle, okay, so it doesn't really communicate directly with the intestine. So we have glucose from the blood, okay, whether it comes from the intestine or it comes from the liver, okay. Uh, how do we get glucose into the muscle? We need a transporter. We have a glute transporter. And the main transporter is GLUT4. There are other transporters depending on the situation, but I want to talk about GLUT4. Often you hear that GLUT4 is insulin dependent transporter. It needs insulin in order to work. That is not true, okay? It's not true. It is not insulin dependent. It is insulin sensitive. So basically, to say it in a hopefully simple way, uh, there are two possible ways to get GLUT4 to the membrane. You may remember that GLUT4 is hidden in vesicles, and when it's needed, it gets to the membrane so that it can let glucose go in, right? So there are two ways to stimulate in the skeletal muscle. There are two ways to stimulate GLUT4 to get to the membrane. One possibility is insulin. Okay, so one possible signal for GLUT4 translocation is insulin. But that only happens after a meal, after we've eaten, okay? Insulin spikes up, we get lots of GLUT4 in, into the membrane, and glucose gets sucked into the muscle. But that has nothing to do with muscle contraction or with the needs of the muscle, okay? It is a completely separate process. This insulin-dependent uptake of glucose into the muscle really serves the purpose of getting rid of glucose from the blood, okay? So we have plenty of glucose in the blood, and we need to get rid of it. Okay, so this is when insulin comes in, 
puts lots of GLUT4 on the, on the membrane of skeletal muscle and huge amounts of glucose are sent into the skeletal muscle to be not metabolized, not broken down, but actually made into glycogen, made into glycogen and stored, stored away, okay? So that is what happens after a meal. And there, skeletal muscle is an absolutely crucial organ, okay? So liver will store a certain amount of glucose, but the majority of glucose really goes into the muscle, and there it's stored, okay? So for metabolic health, for you know, diabetes, and stuff like that, skeletal muscle is a crucial, crucial organ in this situation. But then we have a diff, yeah? Yes, of course there's a limit. Um, I don't know what it is, and it will depend on a lot of factors, but yeah, I mean, it's relatively easy to find the, 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 the average amounts of glycogen that we find in skeletal muscle. And of course, it will differ whether you're a trained athlete, et cetera, but of course there's a limit. It can't be unlimited, yeah. So that's situation one that has nothing to do with muscle contraction, with the need of ATP for contraction. It's just after a meal, we need to get rid of glucose. But then we have a situation when the muscle needs ATP, okay? It's contracting, you know, we're running for a long time or even for a short time, whatever, it needs glucose. But in this situation, there may not be any insulin in the blood, okay? Imagine you wake up in the morning, you overslept, you need to run to catch a bus or something you haven't eaten, your level of glucose in the blood will be zero, okay? Very, very, very low. So we can't rely on insulin to get GLUT4 into the membrane in order for the muscle to start working. We have to have other mechanisms. And indeed, we have other mechanisms, okay? So the other possibility of getting, of activating GLUT4 or getting them to the membrane is through signaling inside the, inside the, um, the muscle fiber. So I'm not gonna draw it in there because it would be a little confusing. So GLUT4, one possibility is insulin. But we said that's a special case after a meal. But the other way to activate GLUT4 to get it to the membrane is through signaling by calcium or calmodulin. Why calcium? Well, if the muscle is contracting and needs ATP from glucose, that means that there's plenty of calcium around, right? Because that's what the, the stimulus contraction coupling, that's what it relies on, increased calcium. So as calcium goes up, you know, it gets from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, et cetera, and we talked about that previously. Calcium goes up, and through calmodulin, calmodulin-dependent kinases, GLUT4s are translocated into the membrane. Okay, nothing to do with insulin. There's no need for insulin. It just goes directly through calmodulin-dependent kinases. And then there's another possible signal. It will hopefully make sense. There's another kinase, and we talked about it last year quite a bit, which is called AMPK. What is AMPK? AMP yeah, it's AMP-dependent kinase. Huh? I think that's in one of the kinase. Yeah, and what does it do, or what, what kind of signal is it when it activates? That there is not enough energy, so not much glucose? Correct. So AMPK is activated when there is not enough ATP. Okay? The ATP stores are going down and AMP kinase is activated. So it makes sense that AMP kinase would be another signal that can translocate GLUT4 into the membrane, okay? As the muscle is contracting, there's not enough ATP, it will activate AMP kinase and put more GLUT4 into the membrane so that, so that the, uh, so the glucose can flow in, okay? Good, so that's one source. We can get glucose from the blood. Another source, obviously, is the stored glycogen. Okay, uh, you all know that muscle glycogen cannot be used for the rest of the body. Why not? That is not the problem. That is not the problem. Yeah, there's glucose. Yeah, there's a lack of glucose six phosphatase which means that once it's glucose 6-phosphate, it can't, it can't go out as, as, as glucose, okay? So that's, that's the real reason. So all the glycogen that we have in the muscle can only be used in the muscle, okay? So of course, the other source of glucose, again, it's the quicker source, okay? So we have it already there where we need it, 
Once again, the glycogen granules are very close to the sarcomeres and to mitochondria and everything, so that they are very, very close. They, nothing has to diffuse. So the other source of glucose is obviously glycogen. Again, the dynamics and the metabolism of glycogen in the muscle is quite complex. So some of the glucose goes into glycogen and then it gets metabolized, etc. It's a very complicated, very tightly regulated process. I'm not going to give you the details, but if you're interested, you can look it up and, and it's quite interesting. Right, so two main sources of glucose from the outside, from the inside. Uh, there are those of you who have done any kind of uh, endurance sports or, or whatever, you know that there's like carb loading and, and there are ways to increase the glycogen stores, etc. But yeah, we don't have that much time to talk about that. Right, what happens to glucose once it gets into the, into the muscle, okay? Or whether, whether it is from glycogen or whether it's from the outside. There are two main possible pathways for glucose, right? I mean, two main, yeah, possible complete metabolic pathways, let's put it that way. Either can be metabolized oxidatively in mitochondria, so it goes through glycolysis and, and then it then goes, as pyruvate, it goes into mitochondria and it is oxidatively metabolized, or it can be metabolized just purely glycolytically to produce lactate. Both of these pathways are used in the muscle. As we, so in the beginning, it's mostly oxidative, so at lower loads, it is mostly oxidative. But as we, as we near 100%, more and more of glucose will be metabolized just to lactate. The reason is um, that, I'm trying to explain this as, as simply as possible, um, the oxidative machinery, so the Krebs cycle and the, uh, well, mainly it's, it's mainly the Krebs cycle, takes a little bit of time to ramp up. Why? Well, if you remember the Krebs cycle, uh, in the beginning, there's a reaction between oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA to form citrate. So we need to have a certain amount of oxaloacetate in order to take the acetyl-CoA and put it into the cycle. And depending on how much oxaloacetate we have, that determines how quickly can we go through all this acetyl-CoA that is coming in. So basically, if we have a large demand for ATP, suddenly we need a lot of ATP, we would have to have a massive amount of oxaloacetate in order for the cycle to start running and basically pulling a lot of acetyl-CoA through. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the, the throughput, the flux through the Krebs cycle depends on how much of these intermediates we already have in place. So if we, have, if we need to make a lot of turns, a lot of a big flux through, uh, through the Krebs cycle, we have to first build up a lot of oxaloacetate, and that takes a lot of time, okay? So basically, you know, the, the oxidative metabolism of glucose is very efficient. It gives us a lot of ATP, but it does not have a lot of huge throughput. We can't put a lot of stuff through it, okay? Or it takes time to ramp up. For glycolysis, that's the other way around. It's not very efficient, but we can put tons and tons and tons of glucose through it per second and it makes relatively fewer ATPs, but we can put just tons, huge amounts of glucose. So that's why at these very high loads, and in fact, also in the very beginning, so um, th this graph could be confusing time with intensity, but in the beginning of exercise, especially high intensity exercise, we may actually have this anaerobic phase when it's, when it's better to just put everything through glycolysis and not bother with the oxidative, uh, with the oxidative metabolism because we don't have time to ramp it up. Okay, so in, in time, very early on, it can be also anaerobic. So we are aerobic, anaerobic. The anaerobic produces lactate. Uh, we know that. The majority of lactate, which is produced in the muscle, is also used in the muscle. So that's something that is a relatively new finding. Okay, so previously it was thought that the muscle is working at 100% you know, uh, load and is sending all this lactate out. Well, in fact, as you know, there are different fibers in the muscle, different fiber types in the muscle, and some of them will be producing lactate very early on. And then the other fibers, the oxidative fibers, will be taking up this lactate and oxidizing it. Slowly, not as efficiently, but will be, will be oxidizing it. So for the majority of functioning of muscle, the majority of the lactate that is produced in the muscle is used by other types, other muscle, uh, other fiber types, and only only when we get to these 
80 plus percent loads will lactate start leaving the muscle and will get into the blood. Okay, so that's something where the individual, the different muscle fibers uh, collaborate basically and, and use the other's waste product uh, for their own synthesis of ATP. Now we talked last year about the muscle fibers. Do you remember what they are in, in humans? What types, what muscle fiber types we have in skeletal muscle? Yeah, so this is a very old way of looking at it, okay? So we have types one, types 2A, and type 2X. These are the three muscle types, muscle fiber types in human skeletal muscles. Type one are these red ones, very oxidative, relatively slow. Type 2A are a little bit less red, more glycolytic, faster and the 2X are the fastest and they are primarily glycolytic. So we go from red to white, okay, from slow to fast, from oxidative to more glycolytic. Okay, this classification is actually based on the type of myosin that they have, myosin heavy chain. Okay, so all these red, white, yeah, it's a very, 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 very old classification. Okay, now we, we use this classification. Yeah, oxidative, so oxidative, glycolytic, slow, fast. This one is the red one. Yeah, I think the red and white is really confusing because it's a continuum, okay? And you get actually many other subtypes in between. Um, so yeah, the red-white is a very crude way of looking at it, let's put it that way. Hmm? Is just right? It is in between, yeah. And as I say, we actually have even intermediate, like one, two A, etc. But yeah, anyway. Do you have uh, different types of myosin fiber? Yes, uh, different types of myosin protein. Okay, so the myosin that's in them is a different. It's pro, it's a product of a different gene, and that's why we can easily distinguish them. Hmm. This is a super interesting thing. If you're interested in muscle, have a look at how the myosin how the expression of, of a specific myosin is, is coordinated with the expression of specific proteins on the neuromuscular junction to really coordinate the type of metabolism, the type of uh, ATPase activity, and the type of signaling that goes into the muscle. It's, it's quite a fascinating thing. All right. Uh, so we had glucose, we have fatty acids. Now, the last group of nutrients which should be mentioned around muscle, must be mentioned around muscle, are amino acids. Amino acids generally do not serve as a major source of energy. So they're not really a big energy substrate. They may do, but, but it's not their main function in the muscle. Of course, in the muscle, amino acids are mostly used to build protein, okay? And, and there is a lot of degradation and rebuilding of protein going on all the time. So when we talked about the bone, when we said it's constantly being broken down and rebuilt, that's what happens in the muscle as well, okay? Especially after exercise, but even without exercise, it is being renewed all the time. Of course, after exercise, it can actually start building up uh, as well. Uh, the most interesting part, uh, or the most relevant, I don't know how to say it, we should talk about branch-chained amino acids, okay? Branch-chained amino acids have special metabolism, have a special role in skeletal muscle. You may recall from last year, maybe you don't. Uh, everything that comes from the gut is metabolized primarily in the liver. Okay, it goes through the portal vein, through the portal vein into the liver, everything is metabolized there. The only exception are branch chain amino acids. They bypass the liver because the liver does not have enough of the, en of the first enzyme of the degradation of BCA, the transaminase. So they bypass the liver, they get into the systemic circulation, and they, their pri primary site of metabolism is skeletal muscle. So they go into the skeletal muscle, they are transaminated to their keto acids, which then can be used by the muscle or they can be sent to the liver for further metabolism. Okay, so there are both possibilities. But the first step occurs, must occur in skeletal muscle, which is very unusual, okay? So here, skeletal muscle is the primary organ for, uh, for branching amino acids, uh, for branching amino acid metabolism. Why is that so? 
we don't know. But one possible reason is, I mean, it's hard to say what is the reason for what, but brown shea amino acids, apart from being metabolized in the liver, actually serve as a very important signal, uh, sorry, in the liver, in the skeletal muscle. They serve as an important signal because they tell the muscle that there is plenty of stuff, there's plenty of amino acids, and it can start growing. So BCAA, and especially leucine, when it is in the blood, it, t it is a signal for the muscle to, to basically allow it to grow, to start synthesizing more protein. The signaling goes through another molecule that we saw last year, related to AMP kinase, but kind of the opposite number of AMP kinase. Does anyone remember what I'm talking about? A signaling complex which tells cells that they can grow, they can divide because there's plenty. Yeah, growth factors are what's from the outside, but this is actually inside the cell. And it's called mTOR, or mammalian target of rapamycin, a crucial, like with AMP kinase, mTOR is a crucial switch that tells the cell that it's enough of stuff, you can grow, you can start dividing. Okay, very important. So, BCAA coming into the skeletal muscle, mainly leucine, but not just leucine, activate mTOR. And mTOR is the master switch telling, let's build more protein, let's build more muscle, okay? We have plenty of stuff, let's do it. This is the reason why after exercise, which causes the activation of calmodulin dependent kinases, AMP kinase, there are some also mechanical signals. Actually, very recently, I think two years ago, a year ago, I don't know, there was a publication that uh, one of the big proteins that, uh, that kind of keeps the sarcomeres in, in place, called titin, you maybe recall that, it's a very large protein, that it has associated proteins that are activated when the muscle contracts, when it actually moves mechanically. And it is probably another signal that kind of tells the muscle, okay, we're working, we need to start building things. So these are the signals that come from exercise. And if after the exercise, you give the muscle already BCA, uh, also BCAAs or, some, or a mixture of proteins and amino acids, etc., this is the last signal that they need, activation of mTOR, to start building protein and to start really increasing mass. Okay? So we have exercise, we have amino acids, and if they come together, uh, then the, uh, the muscle can start growing. All right, our time is up. Uh, I did not mention creatine kinase, creatine, because that's something that we covered last year. Okay, so just look at it, also important, okay? The interplay between ATP and creatine, uh, and creatine phosphate and creatine kinase is important, but I'm not gonna mention that. Very, very, very briefly, <coughs> some markers of muscle health. Markers. So one of the traditional markers of muscle damage is creatine kinase. This enzyme that is absolutely crucial for shuttling energy from mitochondria into the rest of the cell. When the muscle is damaged, it is released into, into the body. It's not super specific because creatine kinase is in all cells in the body, okay? But we do have specific subtypes of creatine kinase for certain types of muscle. So there is a CKMM, which is more skeletal muscle based. And then there's CKMB, which is in the cardiac muscle. Okay, so they are sort of specific for these kind of muscles. Generally, what we measure is the total creatine kinase and just tells us how much of skeletal muscle is damaged for whatever reason, okay? For cardiac muscle, we have specific markers called troponins, but cardiac specific troponins. I'm gonna leave that aside because we will, we will cover that when we talk about the, um, about the heart. Um, another relatively old marker but still used is myoglobin. Once again, it's a protein that is in the muscle. Once you damage the muscle, it leaks out and you can measure it in the, uh, in the blood. In fact, myoglobin in large damage to muscles, for example, in a huge trauma, when, for example, there's an earthquake and you know people are trapped under the, uh, the fallen houses and they have lots of muscle damage, 
there can be so much myoglobin can be released from the muscles that it actually starts precipitating in the kidneys and can, it can cause kidney failure very quickly. Okay? Something that is, is good to know in polytrauma, even here it doesn't have to be an earthquake, but if there is large scale skeletal muscle damage, this myoglobin can damage kidneys as well. All right, any questions? Sorry, we ran through it quite quickly, but as you can see, it's a lot of material, but hopefully it makes sense. No questions? So for the, for the carbohydrate metabolism, there's two states for the, the either it's going to be like glycolysis or anaerobic respiration? Well, glycolysis, and then after glycolysis, after pyruvate, either it can be converted to lactate, and actually the majority of pyruvate is converted to lactate, and this lactate can be just released from the cell. It, the cell doesn't want to do anything with it, or it can be converted back to pyruvate and go into mitochondria and be oxidatively, uh, oxidatively uh, metabolized. And that really depends on how big a flux, how much ATP, how quickly do you, need to, do you need to get. If you need massive amounts of ATP, it's probably going to be anaerobic because you can put a huge flux through it. If you want to be efficient about it, then you definitely use the oxidative path. I mean you, the muscle fiber. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. That's it.